Welcome to this exploration of the Emancipation Proclamation in American Life and Memory. I am Dr. Scott King Owen. I teach at Bexley High School. We're going to take a look at the facts surrounding the creation of the Emancipation Proclamation, what the document actually says, and then how that document is remembered. In the process of doing all this, we're going to take a look at how we tell stories and who we put at the center of those stories and which characters don't often get all of the attention. Emancipation is obviously a really important aspect of the Civil War because it's a momentous shift from what Lincoln ostensibly started the war as to save the Union and what the war becomes. And there's no denying that this shift um, is going to capture the American imagination as it did here for Thomas Nast, who called this particular piece The Emancipation of the Negroes, January 1863, the past and the future. And so at the center is a black family, um, husband and wife, uh, perhaps grandma or aunt, kids all around the hearth, so scenes of home and domesticity are being contrasted with scenes of horror, of running away, of slave sales, of brutal beatings, but also on the right is complemented by scenes of voting, of an education and going to public school. So clearly you cannot talk about the Civil War without talking about this pivotal event. So what we're gonna do is take a few minutes to look at how that came about. Um, so we'll do with the facts first for those people who might not have had uh, some US history in quite some time. And then we'll move on to sort of looking at how um, we tell the story of emancipation and who gets credit for that. Let's start with first with the facts of the situation so we can kind of all be on the same page. Um, you can't really start the story of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. You have to go back to the very beginning of the war itself and realize that runaway folks from the South are actually pushing the issue of what to do about the enslaved. These runaways or contrabands as they are called are refugees. And there are about 400,000 of them in Union camps by 1865, where they are putting pressure on the government by their very presence to say, who are we? What are we? How are we going to be treated? The Union has to think to itself, what is going to be the status of these folks? Um, and very often Lincoln and his commanders disagree, but eventually, um, we see sort of halting movements toward what will become emancipation. And one way to approach that is militarily. The Confiscation Acts of 1861 to 1862, there's two of those, um, allow the North, allow the United States to seize this property of rebels um, and to do so as an act of war. We are confiscating these laborers who bound in service to the South, and we are doing that because it weakens the Southern war effort. But that also opens a door that can never be closed. Once you start setting free and changing the status of these folks, it will set in motion a whole lot of changes that will eventually result in the death of slavery itself. The genie cannot be put back in the bottle, so to speak. The Union commanders, Lincoln phrased all of this uh, in terms of, at the beginning, runaway labor in the war effort. So they set the uh, refugees to work, building ditches, fortifications, all kinds of work in the camps. Um, some were paid, some were not. It took a while for the, the United States to develop a policy of how to think about these folks. Um, so this is a great example of where people on the ground are moving faster than a government can move uh, when it comes to a war effort. 
By September 22nd, 1862, Lincoln will announce his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, um, which he sort of stumbled to, um, careened in the direction of um, after a lot of different steps where he's balancing out fears about moving ahead of you know, public opinion or what's going to be permissible politically. Um, he discussed this in July with his cabinet and then finally released it uh, with the announcement that Southerners would have 100 days to re-enter the Union. If they did, they could keep slavery. If they didn't, emancipation would be used against them. This was announced after the victory at the Battle of Antietam. Um, where Lincoln needed uh, military victory in order to feel like he could move forward on such a controversial policy. The Emancipation Proclamation itself was announced January 1st, 1863, with some slight differences in the text uh, from the preliminary one to the final one. Um, important to note that it did not apply to border states. There were 400,000 enslaved peoples in those border states, and Lincoln was keen on keeping the border states in the Union. It only applied to areas in rebellion. And this is a key legal distinction in the text. Lincoln was exercising his power as commander in chief of the US military, and therefore he could only enact emancipation as an extension of his war power. So he could emancipate only in areas in rebellion. By December of 1865, the 13th Amendment would bring all these strands together and then formally end slavery in the United States. Keep in mind that it's not until July of 1866 that the enslaved owned by the Cherokee uh, nation are actually freed by a treaty with the US government. So emancipation moves slowly depending on the place and the people involved. So what does the text say? Um, the first paragraph uh, is very similar to the original. Um, the key phrase here is, henceforward shall be free. Forever free was the wording in the preliminary one shall be free has a little of amb ambiguity with it. But I would say, once again, this is an example of once this door is open, you will not be able to close that um, and not be able to go back and undo this emancipation when you've got so many people who are seeing just the word free and changing their lives. So freedom would be forever is uh, the key first key point of the text. The second key point, and this is really crucial in understanding the transformation as the Republican Party and Lincoln saw it. First of all, emancipated peoples are encouraged to abstain from violence except for self-defense. Um, but the key part I want you to see is at the very end, they can labor for reasonable wages. This is a reflection of the Republican Party's history as the party of free wage labor, meaning you can sell your labor to the highest bidder. And so a key transformation in Lincoln's mind and a lot of Republicans' minds is not the social status of the enslaved, it is the economic, the work status, being able to sell your labor for wages. So freedom would be forever, Free labor would be the norm. And then finally, Lincoln invited any of these emancipated peoples to give their service to the United States in order to fight on behalf of the Northern war effort. So freedom would welcome you fighting for your nation in order to defeat the South. Very clearly, this is also going to be a military move, right? We're inviting folks to come in and contribute their labor to defeating um, the rebels in the South, the traitors to the nation. 
So notice that none of this is really comprehending the social implications of all these changes. Those would be worked out, um, debated, and then changed dramatically in the years after the uh, Civil War were over, and then continually debated up until today. Most textbooks that deal with the issue of the Emancipation Proclamation say pretty much the same thing about it today. So if you're curious how uh, modern scholars are handling this, um, I use all three of these textbooks in my class. Uh, Brinkley points out that emancipation was limited um, because it's only practically real when the Union Army gains control of the South and then therefore people can run for freedom. Um, so that's Brinkley's text. Um, Henretta points out that the Emancipation Proclamation did not really immediately free anyone. Um, because I would point out, in order to be free, you're going to have to do uh, a walk to freedom on your own two feet. And you're going to have to escape your situation. And maybe that's not going to be practical or workable for you. Eric Foner has the sort of most um, grandiose and lofty view of the Emancipation Proclamation um, because he's thinking about in terms of the nature of the war and what this is going to imply for the ending of the conflict by changing the status of an entire group of people. Um, that is absolutely going to be life-changing. Lincoln himself recognized that it was a pretty life-changing um, act, uh, a pretty momentous act. He famously said, if my name ever goes into history, it will be for this act, and my whole soul is in it. He said that on January 1st, 1863. Um, illustrations of him, like the one shown here, emphasize Lincoln as the heroic emancipator. You know, he's sitting at home with his slippers and his um, dressed down. He's got the emancipation um, in his hand. His other hand rests on the Bible and the Constitution. Uh, apparently, we are draping American flags in the window because we don't have curtains. Um, there's a map so that uh, with a sword, you know, highlighting the hanging of the Civil War sort of over him here. Papers strewn about. So here we have the heroic Lincoln struggling mentally, intellectually with how to conceive of and write this momentous act that he's uh, going to be involved in. Not everybody saw Lincoln that way. This is a very famous um, British cartoon, a satirical magazine called Punch showing Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation as a dramatic gamble. That is, a horned, bedeviled Lincoln here is about to throw down a card, and the card actually is not a spade, though it looks like one. In fact, if you zoom in on the spade, it is the face of an African American. And uh, as Lincoln is going to throw that card down on a barrel of gunpowder, it will be the act of a desperate gambler in the Civil War. The focus on Lincoln does obscure other people involved in the story, people like Frederick Douglass, who didn't meet with Lincoln until after the Emancipation Proclamation, but did hound him in the press, pushing for a war that would destroy slavery. Lincoln did, however, meet with other Northern African Americans, ministers, and other groups who also called for a war of liberation, and in fact, also pushed Lincoln to condemn colonization, which he did not initially, um, because in Lincoln's mind, um, African Americans and white Americans could not be together in the United States, and therefore they needed to be colonized in another place um, in Latin America, that's the plan he had in mind. Um, folks in the black community absolutely rejected that. Lincoln also had to contend with his fellow Republicans, uh, particularly the radicals, Sam and Chase, Charles Sumner, Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens, who had pushed and pushed and pushed for Lincoln to have definitive statements to move on the issue of emancipation. Um, and they themselves um, had ended slavery in Washington, D.C. in 1862, 
with a bill that did provide compensation, um, which was not particularly the abolitionist way, but most legal scholars at the time said that the only way you could take property was if you compensated for it. Um, this is essentially the, the gist of the Fifth Amendment, the takings clause. Lincoln's preliminary draft um, in July of 1862, he did share with his cabinet members, in fact, it was linked, and Lincoln had to go on the offensive to, to argue that um, he was not moving uh, for a major change in social policy, that in fact, he was thinking about union instead. He was trying to save the nation. In his mind, he was you know, thinking carefully about Northern public opinion, um, hoping that the enslaved could be brought into the military, um, hoping that if they were, you know, more successful militarily, um, it might justify this major change in the status of a group of people. And Lincoln almost seemed to hesitate, um, which is why many scholars have talked about he stumbles into this or he um, sort of falls into it in a sort of halting way. And then Lincoln is also conscious of Northern Democrats, um, those in the other party who will denounce emancipation and call it unconstitutional and complain that uh, there would be revolts, um, race wars, that African Americans would steal white jobs. And in fact, there were several um, race riots that broke out in the North um, in this time period. Also part of the story is, of course, the emancipated, those who took freedom into their own hands. And it's important, I think, to talk about them because African Americans who are in the South who are running away to freedom are not going to see emancipation through its legal form. They're not going to get the copy of the Emancipation Proclamation and go, check, check, oh yeah, sure, I get this is military necessity here. Um, so their legal uh, understanding didn't really matter. Um, it was a tool for self-emancipation. And as soon as people encountered the possibility of flocking to a, a Union army, they did so, as this group here, for example, is pictured. So this heroic idea of emancipation, Lincoln the emancipator, the great emancipator, versus the reluctant emancipator, versus all the self-emancipators, you know, where does it come from? Well, a lot of it comes from the media produced surrounding emancipation. So for example, we have Lincoln here, hands pointed toward heaven, showing emancipation as providing freedom, not just for the enslaved, but freeing white folks as well. By ending slavery, it benefits everyone. Lincoln here again, finger pointing to heaven as the enslaved is, man is thankful uh, for Lincoln as his wife and children look on. It's imagery like this, as well as recollections of people after the war, that create our sort of focus on um, Lincoln as the great emancipator. It's this material culture that survives and is replicated throughout time that helps build our story of emancipation. So how does that memory work? Well, for one thing, the memory works across time in the memories of the actual enslaved folks. And we know a lot of their stories thanks to the WPA narratives. Um, these were collected in the 1930s uh, under the Works Progress Administration as part of the New Deal. And so people went and interviewed all the elderly African Americans they could. They're, these interviews are all online, so you can read them. And you can see trapped in the memories of these folks um, certain ideas about who Lincoln is. Um, Charlie Moses, for example, says he's Lincoln's that man who sets us free. Hannah Crasson called Lincoln the instrument of God. We see also in memory Lincoln as the central figure, as a villain. Southerners, particularly writing after the war as a lost cause, 
um, perspective, trying to explain how they lost this war that they were convinced God was on their side for, blame Lincoln as a black Republican. They criticize his imperial edict of emancipation. And what helps make Lincoln then the center is that everybody's talking about him. Whether you hate him or you think he is the instrument of your liberation, he's the center of the story. Lincoln's own assassination makes this historical memory about martyrdom. The fact that Lincoln is shot on Good Friday and dies on Easter brings a whole host of religious connotations to his story of emancipation. It's as if he gave his life in sacrifice to all of this. And the story then gets replicated across time. Most Northern communities celebrated Emancipation Day. Typically, September 22nd um, would be the day picked. Sometimes January 1st, but who wants to have a parade in the cold? So uh, here in Columbus, for example, the African-American community always did in September. And they would march down Broad Street. They'd hold picnics in Franklin Park. They'd give speeches. The governor would be invited. These were times of public commemoration and keeping alive this mythos about Lincoln. Juneteenth um, only later became a celebration based in the announcement of emancipation to the enslaved in Texas by General Gordon Granger, June 19th of 1865. So this is even an indication of how emancipation takes time to seep across the American landscape. Juneteenth will become a much more prominent holiday in the 20th century. All of this would be reinforced by the material culture of selling emancipation, emancipation memorabilia, emancipation imagery, pictures of Lincoln, copies and facsimiles of the Emancipation Proclamation itself. So the story we get even today, Lincoln the Emancipator bringing freedom, bringing that cup of liberty to the enslaved. And material culture has reinforced that story. I'm going to focus toward the end on a few illustrations of that material culture musically, since I like music as a musician. Um, and I'm going to start with a song um, that is essentially the origin of Go Down Moses, though this is not quite exactly the Go Down Moses that you know. Um, this apparently is a song that the, um, the contrabands themselves would sing as they marched into Union armies and said, we're here, we're free, thank God for freedom. Um, so the song sounds in many ways familiar. The Lord doth now to this nation speak, O oh, let my people go. The bruised reed ye shall not break, O oh, let my people go. Then go down, free men, away down to Dixie's land, and tell Uncle Sam to let my people go. So it's a little bit different. Um, and by the way, I sang the parody version where um, it's a, a riff on the original song that the contraband sang about Moses freeing the children of Israel. The parody version features Dixie land um, instead of Pharaoh's land and Uncle Sam instead of Moses. But the message is still there. And that message is the government, Uncle Sam, needs to proclaim freedom, but the freemen themselves will have to go down and make it happen. Another piece, um, a more singable piece that is not familiar to modern audiences, um, is this Emancipation Chorus, which focuses on men You'll notice in the lyrics that the emphasis here um, is not on an expansive vision of freedom that includes uh, women, maybe something different for them, um, but it talks about the elevation of manhood. 
As brothers all, then follow the call for freedom and emancipation. A man is a man, deny it who can, it shall be so at last in this nation. Okay, not a bop by modern standards, obviously, but notice the a man is a man phrasing here that emancipation is creating a status for someone um, and setting them free to be a full man and not just a servant bound uh, to service to another. There are other ones. Uh, this Manuel Fenolosa's Emancipation Hymn um, is not particularly singable. I'd need a quartet to pull it off anyway. Um, lots of references you'll find uh, to the sin of slavery um, and how that sin of slavery affected all of the United States and therefore the whole of the United States needs to respond in order to get rid of the blight of evil. So through the slave hound's lair peels the mandate of salvation, let my people go. That's an echo of that contraband hymn. Asking for a land, for a land united. We forgot the slave, prayed we for our country, for our country blighted. And once again, this is a national sin, and as a national sin, we need to address it as a nation. A much more humorous one with some dialect in it, way goes Cuffy. Cuffy is um, a corruption of an African day name um, and was commonly used as a name for um, African Americans, but often featured too in blackface minstrelsy. Uh, this is sort of like a generic stock African American character. Um, so you'll notice um, in here we've got this language that is meant to imitate um, the language of an African American. Abram Lincoln last September told the South, lest you surrender. That's the voice you're supposed to hear this in. Afford a lass of next December, away goes Cuffy. South days mad at North's invasion, said Abe Lincoln's proclamation. Don't go down in darky nation, nor away goes Cuffy. Abe sustains his trying station, says to France and English nation, just stand back with mediation, away goes Cuffy. So you're supposed to see this and laugh in the sense that there's all these political things happening, um, but it doesn't matter because away goes Cuffy. An enslaved person is going to walk away to freedom no matter what's going on, no matter how the white folks are fighting. They're going to hear the news and they're going to take off on their own feet. I want to end with a non-musical version of what life was actually like for the emancipated. And it's because we have a letter explaining the ideas of one of these folks. This is Jordan Anderson, who lived in Tennessee and moved to Dayton, Ohio. And while in Dayton, he um, had a job working for Valentine Winters, who took Jordan Anderson's thoughts and wrote a letter in response to Jordan's former owner asking for Jordan to return home. So imagine you've come to freedom, you've left Tennessee, you're now in Ohio, and you get a letter from your former master and it says, come back, I'll pay you, your kids can go to school. Okay, so what does emancipation look like for you and would you give that up in order to go back south? And the answer is no. Jordan makes $25 a month now and he, that's specifically in the letter. He is a paid free man selling his um, labor for money. His wife Mandy is now Mrs. Anderson. See the elevation in her status She's not just Mandy with no respect. She has been elevated. And his children, Millie, Jane, and Grundy, now go to school. So for him, for Jordan, this is not just a moment of selling my freedom, fighting for the Union. This is not about the military. This is about giving my family the things that I've wanted to give to them. 
um, an elevation in their status and education. And I can do that if I work and sell my labor. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, look, if you want me to come back to Tennessee, you're going to have to um, tell me what you're going to pay me in order to get me to move down. And a little bit tongue in cheek, Jordan says, essentially, um, if you also want me to come back, you're going to have to pay me for all the work I did when I was there. Otherwise, I'm not going to trust that, in fact, you have my best interests at heart. And so he adds it all up, does a complete accounting in this letter, and comes up with the figure of 11680 bucks as what is demanded uh, for back pay. Now, to put that in context, that's $189,000 today. That's his back pay for all the years of service. I think clearly Jordan is having a little bit of fun at his former owner's expense. Um, there's a tongue-in-cheek quality to the letter. Um, it does end with uh, a line that makes you laugh, and it's the line that um, where Jordan says, Now thank my friend uh, for taking the gun away from you when I left your place. So Jordan has no intention of returning home and has certainly needled his former owner. Um, by calling him out for what um, was the status of his life and his existence under um, enslavement. The story of the Emancipation Proclamation as we end is the story not just of freedom being given, but freedom being taken by people who walked to freedom, who fought for freedom, who risked their lives and their families in order to seek out a new life for themselves. These are people who did not wait to be delivered, but took freedom into their own hands. Thank you for your time and attention. Best wishes.